Alright, so we in here with Dao Bay, man. Philadelphia legend, Philadelphia OG, you know what I mean? Do for self and all that. Fine print. Got a lot going on these days, man. Exactly. You know, you know what I mean, we in 2017, going to 2018. We got a lot of big stuff going on. So we're going to get the people that. But before we get to that, we want to start at the beginning, you know what I mean? So you're from South Philly. You know what I mean, what part of South Philly to be is it? Um, I'm from 23rd and Tasker. 23rd and Tasker, right. Yeah. So, yeah, give them the rundown, like, what it was like growing up back in the days when you came up, you know, down South Philly. You know, not South Philly been notorious for years, especially back then. So you could give them the rundown what it was like for you. Like. Well, just going all the way back, you know, just as a young adult, <clears throat> being one of the first African-American families in the, the South Philadelphia area, 23rd Street, 23rd and Tasker Street area, and being one of the first African American Muslim families in Philadelphia has always posed somewhat of a challenge for me as a young guy because having a name like Dawood back then it wasn't common, it wasn't sexy, it wasn't popular to have a name, an Arabic name that was different than what we call or considered to be slave names that slave owners gave us. So just having a name Dawood Bay posed a threat or some form of intimidation to people who didn't understand who I was, what I represent, and what I stood for as a person. So these were challenges that I had, this, this biased challenges that I had growing up that I had to face just as a young youth growing up. So uh, it was always a challenge, you know, and I'm talking about from leaving Sister Claire Muhammad School and going to a Muslim school, an all-black school, an all-Muslim school, who taught you that the white man was the devil, taught you that basically like you was living in like an, a, a, a sheltered environment. So leaving uh, Sister Claire Muhammad School and going to McDaniel Public School was like a culture shock to me. So I'm coming to these schools, I'm coming with a Muslim name, and you know, I, I, people didn't quite understand who I was and what that really meant, because they wasn't used to being around people with those type of names. So just to mention what it's like for me to grow up in South Philadelphia is a, com it's a very com complex story. <laughs> because like I said, when you look at it, <clears throat> us coming up, not really being a whole lot of African Americans, in the neighborhood, and then growing up, not being a lot of Muslims in the neighborhood. So it was always you kind of somewhat having, having to reintroduce yourself to people because people always kind of think they had a, uh, a premeditated thought of who they thought you was. So you always find yourself having to reintroduce yourself to people. So the struggle in South Philadelphia, you had to be tough. You understand? You had to have tough skin. You know, you had to really know who you were and really be confident in who you were or you'll be ran over, you, your self-esteem will be destroyed. So you have to have like, what we down in South Philly we like to call tough love. So, you know, we, we love hard and we hate hard <laughs> down in South Philly. And growing up, with you got the Italian neighborhood in South Philly, you got the Irish neighborhood in South Philly. So there's always been a little bit more structure down South Philly as it relates to the streets and how politics was on the streets. So during those times, it, it, it was order. It was a little bit better order because you had uh, guys like my father and them from uh, during the times of the Nation of Islam. And then these are the guys who was quote unquote given the title of the Philadelphia Black Mafia. But they never gave themselves that title. They never embraced that title as something that they stood for. However, that name was given to them. So, but at the same time, these was guys who really had a different type of concern as it relates to what was going to go on in our communities. So I kind of come from uh, a fighting, uh, a fighting spirit, a spirit that uh, when when we see or we receive opposition, we're pressed back. You know, rather it's politically, you know, rather it's physically, 
you know, or just hating it in our heart. We ain't, we not the type of people that's not gonna have no stand or no position at all. One thing my father always told me, always told me to never be afraid to uh, show someone that you're a part of something. So you ever got got to be a part of something that's bigger than yourself, a cause or going a purpose that's bigger than yourself. So a lot of these maximums that was being paid, passed down to us, it kind of seeped into the environment. And this is how you had all of the gangs in South Philly. 24th Street, 23rd Street, 17th Street, 5th Street, 7th Street. Then you got all the surrounding projects. All the projects, if you notice, down South Philadelphia is on the outskirts of the city, close to the highways. So you got all these projects and stuff around South Philly. You got all these different neighborhoods because as we know, Philadelphia itself is known as the city of neighborhoods. But South Philly is even more concentrated, you know, because it's so small. You know, uh, uh, you can have guys fighting and killing each other on 22nd Street and 21st Street. You know, but in North Philly or West Philly, things are a little more spread it out a little bit more. They got more two-way streets and four-way streets. South Philly ain't nothing but a bunch of alleys down there, man. <laughs> so, you know, we it's, it's like we live like sardines. So the intensity has always been different, you know, and it's just, it's just a real struggle for African-American men growing up in South Philadelphia. You have to be tough, you have to be strong, you have to be confident, you know what I mean? And you, you have to know how to survive. All right. All right, so at what age and at what point did you actually, you know, get out there and get active? Like, what made you decide to go that route and give them that rundown? Well, as far as, as it relates to the streets, uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a silver spoon kind of guy, you know, uh, that, that, that same energy, that same toughness that it took to survive in South Philly is what, is, is kind of what leads you to do things out of desperation. And a lot of people think, oh, well, you had other choices. As a conscientious adult, you can sit back and reflect. And in reflection, as they say, hindsight is always 20, 20, 20. So you can sit back and reflect as a conscious adult and you say, well, now you ask the question, did you have other choices? You can think about it now and say, yeah, I probably did have other choices, but during that time, I couldn't see the other opportunities and other choices that was in front of me. My mother went to prison. My father was, you know, inactive, not around so much or whatever. Uh, and you had to know how to survive. You know what I mean? I was living in a house with no gas, no electric. We had electric, is on illegal. We had gas, it was on illegal to the catches. We used to have an old illegal cable. <laughs> so, but in other words, it was tough. You know what I mean? Your mom being in prison, I think my mom went to prison when I was probably like 15 or 16 years old. And that's a tough time in your life. During that time, around that time, too, my house caught on fire. So you have to know how to survive, you have to figure it out. I used to start out having house parties, in case y'all wonder, like, where does God get into the entertainment business? How are you in the music and stuff? I also went to Sutherland Music School. My mother, I used to play the piano. And my mom uh, sent me to play the piano because she wanted me to learn how to uh, be calm. So I wanted to play the drums, but she said the drums were too violent. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, circumstances is what forced me in particular into the streets because I never really had a desire to be a drug dealer or to sell drugs or do things you know that was harmful to myself and or to my community. My aspiration was always I wanted to win the respect of intelligent people and affection of children. So uh, before we go into that part of my life, but it, it's it's like a it's it's like you got to do what you got to do. That's it's part of that do for self mentality. You understand when you're in a bad situation, your back against the wall. We like carnivores. We eat meat. We don't. We can't. We don't eat flowers and stuff. We can't eat flowers and live off the land from eating flowers and stuff like that. You got to be a carnivore, especially growing up in South Philadelphia. A carnivore is a person that don't eat meat. And it's like a tiger. In fact, our logo is getting ready. We get ready. our logo. I'm gonna surprise y'all. I'm gonna show y'all what our logo is. But our logo is the panther. The Black Panther, and the Black Panther is the logo of Do For Self because within the nature of a Black Panther, he
He has to kill in order to eat. You gotta know how to survive. And the type of focus that you have to have to be a panther and to be a carnivore, you have to have a focus on your prey at all times. And you can't look back, you can't lose your focus because you never know when you're going to be to feed yourself and be to feed your family. So that was the that was the mindset that look, I got to get out of here and I got to figure out how I'm gonna do something for myself. And good thing I was taught that way. I come from that type of background because I, I, I see many of my friends that they know what to do and couldn't survive. So they became dope fiends and smoking heroin and smoking coke and doing all kind of other stuff that just destroyed them, them themselves. My thing, I was just trying to figure out how I could make a living for myself and, and, and get from one place to another so I could have an opportunity to do something meaningful with myself. All right. All right, I want to jump back a little bit because you mentioned something that was interesting. I wanted to bring this up. So you said back in South Philly, you know, y'all had the, the, the Irish there. Y'all had the Italian there. <clears throat> now, you know, they had the, the Italian mafia is notorious in Philly. And, you know, at the time it was the quote unquote black mafia thing too down there. So at one point in time, was there some type of conflict between them? Like, how did they coexist? Because I thought, I, if I don't recall correctly, like one of the mob bosses from Philly didn't want no drug dealing down South Philly. And then it somehow worked out that it was getting done anyway. So speak on a little bit on that. Like, is that some truth to that? Well, of course, I was a child during those times, but I had the privilege of being in certain conversations. But uh, as it relates to the, the, the cohesiveness between the two, um, there was always a, a certain uh, measure of respect for each other. So you had more intelligent, savvy, slick hustlers that understood that at the end of the day they was trying to get serve one purpose and their purpose was trying to advance themselves in their communities. So there was it was it was never an outright conflict, but I'm sure it's been it was conflicts but they had some measure of communication and that's what was really important, the open line of communication. And then it was the prison systems. The prison system you know, uh, brought everybody together. You know, although we may be in different parts of the city or different neighborhoods, but when we're in prison, we're all in the same building. So a lot of stuff was being negotiated and dealt with by, because of the relationships that was going on in the prisons. Prisons was dictating what was going on in the streets sometimes. All right, all right so now, the Bay family. I uh, mean, a lot of people in Philly, like especially from my era, you know, we used to hear that going, going, growing up, like about the family. It was well-known family. So, give them that rundown of the history, of, uh, a little bit of the history of the Bay family. Like, why, why so many people know about it, but the story behind it, like. Well, it kind of go back to the beginning, like I said, just having the name. You know, it was different. You know, it was different. Nobody had Muslim names back in the 70s and the 60s and stuff like that. So like from that point, that energy kept moving forward. It was always like Bay, Dao, Rabia, Khadija, you know, this, these names was different, you know? So it's it always uh, germinated a certain amount of attention just because of the name itself. And, and, and then, you know, um, it's notorious. <laughs> <laughs> it's notorious for his reasons, you know, and um, at the end of the day, it's, it's people, and, and that's the thing about Philadelphia in general, when people know you, they know your last name. It's families all over the city like that, you know, and, feel, and it's just that the base is just, just one of those families, and just so happen to be from South Philly. You got families, the Myers family, you got plenty of families down there, the Starks. They 95 deep, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, the, and that's how it is in South Philly. A lot of us call each other by our first and last names, you know? So that's how our name kind of carry, carry itself forward like that. All right, so fast forward a little bit, you got active. You was out there doing what you was doing. And then at some point in time, you had took a fall you know, you had caught a case, ended up um, getting locked up in the feds and all that. It was a multi-million dollar case, you know what I mean? So you was at that, one of the highest levels you could get to as far as that. So speak on like the, 
the, the rundown from you starting and getting to that point and then taking that fall, like, and give them that rundown. It doesn't relate to this, you say getting to that point? Yeah, like, you, you, you got out there, you got active, you, you did what you had to do, you made it to that level, and then you ended up falling, like, so give them that story. Well, greed is what gets you to that point. You know, you set out with a goal or cause and purpose, and then you set up a cause or goals. <laughs> you know, and then something happened to you, and then you chase another goal. So it's like the whole dynamics of the streets and just the mentality of it is just it's not really good. You know, so to to, to, to get into that point, it's, it's a lot of stuff that you gotta get to to be at that point on the streets, you know, where you can basically do what you're trying to do. But it's, it's, it's so many sacrifices that you gotta give and that you gotta pay to to be at that level. And then you ask yourself after it's all said and done, is it really worth it? And at the end of the day, it's really not worth it. You know, so what difference do it make what it took to get to that point, really? Like, you know, nothing really. Just being a nigga. <laughs> being somebody that's willing just to do a bunch of stuff that he shouldn't be doing to get to where he's trying to go. You know, and what happens is you get stuck because you don't realize the hustle become a drug. You know, you, you be selling them, but you become addicted to them yourself. You become addicted to the drive, the, the high, or the, the excitement, or the, the lifestyle, or whatever it may be. And But when you fall, you understand? That's when you realize uh, what, was, what was it really worth it. You understand? Was it really worth it? And then you only can go back a certain period in your life as a hustler and say, this was justified. But at a certain period, you can't really justify that life. Because you start out this saying, man, I just want to be, to be in a position to do something to help me and my family. You know, and then you get caught up. <laughs> you know what I mean? So there's nothing wrong with that. That's like the, the mind of the panther. That's the, that's the carnivore. That's the survivor in you. But you still got to realize once you get to a certain point, you got to keep those goals, set those goals, and get yourself back on the right track. So and when you don't, that's what's going to happen to you. You're going to fall and you're going to fall hard. All right. So what was the experience like when you when you like went to prison and stuff like that? Cause you yeah, that's a good question. I like that. I like that topic. I like the first night. I like to talk about the first night that they actually closed the cell door. And a lot of people may not understand. I said to them, actually, that was the best phone I ever had. Like in a while, really. Because that was my first step towards normalcy, finding some type of normalcy in my life. Because as most of my adult or young adult life into into my adult life, because you gotta remember, I didn't go to prison never until I was 36 years old. So I first went to prison, I was 36. So most of my adult life, I really never lived a normal life. And a lot of us don't understand what a normal life really is. The street mentality, the street corner mentality, and the street life that we live is not normal. It's just so desensitized that we think it's normal. You know, because we just think, you know, it's just normal shit. Such as us got killed. Yeah, man. Hey, so what happened the game the other day? Because we desensitized. We don't even give a fuck no more about people getting killed right in front of our face. So, and when we selling drugs and the damage that we're doing to our community, we don't look at how what the damage it is because we desensitize. You know, so at the end of the day, um, that, that night brought a certain amount of reflection and a certain amount of calm over me because I was really tired of living the life that I was living. You know, I was really tired because really like a few weeks prior to me uh, being indicted, uh, I was in the newspaper a lot. So the burden of being indicted was on me. And the burden of my past and the burden of everything that I was doing was already on you. So once that night, that night was a common moment. And I always talk about the ceiling. Because when you land in a, in a, in a bunk, all you can do is, and I land on the top bunk, and all you can do is basically look at the ceiling. Right before you go to sleep, you're just looking. And you don't have no choice but to listen to your conscious. And your conscious is now telling you stuff, the same stuff that it was telling you before, but 
that you, you the volume of the streets, the volume of the women, the volume of the money, the volume of the drugs, that volume was higher in your head and you couldn't hear your self-conscious speaking to you. But on those nights when they close that door on you, you understand, you don't have no choice but to listen to your subconscious telling you, you know that wasn't right. You know this ain't right. You know you shouldn't have did that. And I think it's really, it was, it was a process because now that subconscious, that volume, that voice of that subconscious was beginning to get louder now. And I could hear it more. And it was, or it was the beginning of my growth and development. All right. So how long did you actually end up doing? And then what was the transition like coming back out of that situation and coming home? Well, I did 10 and a half years. I did five, maybe four years in solitary confinement. I did two years straight in solitary confinement because of the, the sensationalism of my case. And we speak about um, solitary confinement. And, and the thing about that that people don't understand is that it's really unconstitutional. <laughs> it's really unconstitutional. But the experience that I went through, my first time ever being in jail at 36 years old was the first time I've been in jail. So I, I had high level intensity, like at the highest level of FBI investigation that you can get, the tactics, the, the all of the training, all of the training and tactics that they learned, they exercised on me, <laughs> you know, and at the end of the day, that was the trial and the test of my life. But different things was coming to me that was helping me, giving me strength, like fasting, doing a run around and down. My dad died, uh, I believe, um, October. My dad died probably like October the 20th, I believe, in 2004. And I never told this story, so this is exclusive. <laughs> Bullshit.